salvation. Thank you for your love. Lord, thank you for redemption. Hallelujah. <laughs> Let me just tell you right now, unless you're redeemed, there's no way that you can even begin to relate to God. You know, I see a lot of people trying to get church folks to interact with the Holy Ghost and they've not been born again yet. Until you've been born of the Spirit, you can't interact with the Spirit. Everything that belongs to the Holy Ghost is foolishness, can't be understood, has no rational reality to it, has meaningless, it has no application in your life. Right now, God, the Holy Spirit is here. He wants to transform your life. He wants to grab a hold of you, but you've got to surrender everything. He wants to come upon you and change you into a new person. He, he, uh, somebody say, well, the Lord just needs to take me like I am. He's not going to take you like you are. Well, he's going to call you like you are. Isn't that good? A holy, holy God who is not going to have anything to do with a bunch of demons. He reaches out to men and calls us like we are. Come on now. You know, listen, listen Jesus, looked at, Jesus looked at Israel. That had, men had been so corrupted by iniquity. He looked at the best, the best of the best in religion. And he said, you are of your father the devil. His works you do. Men who was once shaped in the image and the likeness of God had taken on the image and the likeness of their father, Satan. People want, in a humanistic world, they want to say, I'm not so bad. I'm, they want people to come and, you know, pat them on the back and tell them how wonderful they are and how good they are. You know what? Father has given us an opportunity to be transformed and to be changed. And then, and look, come on now. Do you understand there? Look at me. Do you understand there? Just for a moment, just act like the church of Asia for just a moment. <laughs> act like you're in China and be happy about these things. Act like somebody has gave you some good news. I know, that, I know that the Western society is under the affliction and the torment of hell right now. Under the stronghold and snare of deception. I don't mean nothing. I'm here to break off that yoke. I'm going to tell you right now, we, God's raising up some people that know how to bulldoze right through all that mess. I mean, he was getting into some Holy Ghost nuclear explosions. People used to say TNT. Forget about TNT, man. That's archaic. I'm telling you, we're talking about some, we can talk about some nuclear warheads in the spirit. Man, we're about to bust everything you've ever thought of. All the things you've imagined about Jesus, most of them are wrong. Unless those concepts are clearly Define for you in the Word of God. Most of what modern day Christianity defines Jesus to be is a wrong Jesus. He's nothing like that. Don't look nothing like that. Don't act nothing like that. Isn't anything like that. And I know it because they say that they received the life of Jesus. And then look at how they act. Forget about it. The life of Jesus is the life of God. It's a glorious life. It's holy, holy, holy. It's a wonderful life. It's a life of purity. It's a life of authority. It's a life of the Spirit. It's a heavenly life. There's no hell in it. It's a life, it's a life absent of every demon power, every demon influence. Satan comes and has nothing in me. Hallelujah. Woo-hoo. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I know that you've, you've basically been raised in a culture and you've been taught how to be entertained. God's not interested in that. People silently stand w around and watch one or two people who's got it <laughs> and just get entertained. God wants you to participate. There's no way that you ever get to step into these things in any dimension with God, not even in the first moment of salvation without participation amen, amen. amen. hallelujah amen. and that should be good news amen. now there was a day when everybody had to just stand around and watch one guy go get blessed when he went into the holies of holies one, there was a time where everybody just had to stand around and go wow wonder what it's like Woo. when they had to when they got they, they got to watch a company of priests who are taught how to worship God and given an anointing to minister to the Lord. Stand there and begin to proclaim the mighty acts and the deeds of the Most High. Everybody just had to listen because they couldn't participate. 
They had no way to feel it. They had no way to be moved by it. They could not, they could not learn the words. If they did, they would forget them quickly. Today, you and I are taught of God. <laughs> Today, the Holy Ghost has been supplied to us on a level that Christ Jesus said it would be an exhaustible expression of the presence of the living God. It would be the only way he could conceptualize it in such a way that, well, say it in such a way that we could conceptualize it. He said it would be like rivers gushing out of you. Somebody said, how much of the presence of God should I have in my life? It should be on the scale of rivers gushing out of you. It should look like Niagara Falls and Victoria Falls on the Zambezi all colliding together. And too many of God's people don't even know how to get out a little grunt of hallelujah. Mangaya. Citrum. Pifrum. Masai. Kai. Boksana. Ekse. Hallelujah. <laughs> but I tell you right now, such will be said of none of you. No, sir. I just can't abide it. God made me a watchman in the house, and I'm up in everybody's space saying, Hey, what is it that you're doing in the place? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody told me they said, Oh, you like John the Baptist. No, I ain't that radical yet. He would people would come to be looky loose and he'd say, Who warns you to flee from the wrath of God, you vipers? I'm not that radical. Somebody said, well, he was in another administration. He was before grace came. He was the introducer of grace. I'm telling you right now, the fullness of grace. He was the one who introduced grace, Jesus. He was given the assignment to say, everybody, now let me present to you Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Lamb of God, the only begotten Son. That was his task. Yeah. And you know, in order to be able to do his assignment of introducing Jesus, he had to sort it out. He had to sort it out. He says, now the axe is laid to every tree. That's radical. Go to church. The axe is laid to the tree. Every tree that does not bring forth the fruit of God is chopped down. Oh, my, 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 my. Hey, listen. Prepare the way of the Lord. He wants to come. Prepare the way. Open wide the gates. The King of Glory wants to come in. He's not going to come in and, and fellowship with a bunch of rancid worldly stuff. He's not going to be glorified in the midst of a people who can't decide whether they want to serve demons or the Holy Ghost. It's time for you to make ready. It's time for you to decide whose side you're on. It's time for you to make a stand for right or wrong. It's time for you to grab a hold of the spirit of holiness, the power of sonship, the divine ability to walk with God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's time. It's time. You can be seated. Listen, people, we welcome all of you, but we're here to talk to you about the perilous times that you're living in. We have no time to waste. People are always thinking, well, it's going to be some other time, and it's those folks over there, and, you know, everybody's pointing fingers, uh, whoever's got seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I tell you, whoever not has, does not have the doctrine of God has the doctrine of devils. Everybody's pointing the fingers of accusation, saying all this and that about the other. Whoever has not been born again has, and has yet to find this reality of relationship whereby you overcome the world, that's what's false. The power of sonship and the authority that God has given to us to walk with Him. To have a clean dividing line. When people make, make it, as it were, obscure, make the line fuzzy and hard to distinguish between right and wrong, that's a doctrine of devils. That's seducing spirits. Where men say that you can live in an unrighteous way and you can live wrong and die right, that's a seducing spirit. That's the spirit of deception. That's the spirit of antichrist. When people say, oh, tongues are of the devil and the manifestation of the Holy Ghost don't belong to the church this day. That's the doctrines of hell. You would try to stop that which God ordained as the means to propagate 
the message of the gospel throughout the earth. You know, you, can't, you cannot sit down and read the Gospels and not be impacted by one miracle after the next miracle after the next miracle after the next miracle after the next miracle. It wasn't just a little spotted here and there. I recently did, not too long ago, I did a, a, a book. It's called The Sequential Events in the Life of Jesus or Chronological Description. And I did it for the purpose because I wanted people to handle the Word of God, the Gospels, all in one confluent story. One unbreakable story and message so that folks could be impacted by how Jesus ministered and what Jesus showed us to do. So that you could handle Jesus. Listen, we gave you a commandment last Sunday to read the Bible in 90 days. We gave you a commandment because the reality of it is you should, be, you should be giving yourself more to the Word of God than that. That's like only an hour a day. To read the Bible in 90 days is only an hour a day. And that includes Sunday. You're not off because you went to the church. <laughs> In fact, people shouldn't want to be off. But you know what I've discovered is people don't know anything. Really, they don't know anything about discipline when it comes to God. They may be very disciplined when it comes to work and to their own interest. They may be very driven. But when it comes to having the lifestyle of God, commitment to God, and the things that are participating with the Spirit of the Lord, that it's lacking. You know, and I don't want to embarrass anybody. But I mean, I commanded you, and if, you, and if, you didn't, if you're not participating, you were just disobedient. And so what we're doing is we're giving you an evidence so that you can quantify your disobedience. Why? Because the, your mind will play tricks on you. You will imagine yourself to be something that you're not, when all the time there was fruit that was quantifiable. There were descriptions continually showing you who you are of and what spirit you are of. The Lord said, make the fruit good and it's the tree good and the fruit good, or make the tree evil and it's fruit evil. But don't make a good tree and evil, with evil fruit or vice versa. Amen. People are always creating self-justification rather than coming and being rebuked, instructed, and directed by the Holy Ghost. People don't want to be rebuked today. They want to be told that you're okay, you're all right. They want to be validated when they're wrong. That's false judgment. Somebody said, you can't judge. I am a judge in God's house as much as any person appointed to the Supreme Court. God has already judged. His judgments are just and they are established forever. If I do not declare His judgments, then I am a deceiver. Like the ones I'm talking about right now. People, people don't want to believe under righteousness. The very, very foundation of the scripture is to be born again, given a new heart, a new spirit. And this new heart believes under righteousness. No, today, the deceiving, seducing spirit says, oh, we're all unrighteous. Nonsense. There were even people that were running a risk of being righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah. Far before salvation came. Are you listening to me? Abraham was able to argue with God. Abraham said, Father, if there be 50 righteous, the Lord didn't say, oh, there's none righteous. No, not one. People take the verses of Scripture that they have no understanding of, that they listen to some other person who's just propagating that which they themselves have heard that they knew nothing about either, taking it out of context and misapplying it entirely to the church of Jesus Christ. One of the primary subjects of the Bible is righteousness. Let, it, let no man deceive you. He that does righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. Uh-oh, John knew something that the rest of the world doesn't know today. Come on, I, I just, you know, I challenge people all the time. Just take a month and read First John, the first epistle of John, every day. You, that wouldn't take you long at all. That would take you less than an hour. In fact, if you could easily memorize the first epistle of John inside of one month, easily, the whole thing. And, you know, and then all of a sudden, now you're going to be handling the word because there's a lot of the seducing, deceiving, lying things going on. Somebody said, how do I tell if, it, if, they, if that word or that declaration isn't speaking exactly what God said in his word, huh, that it's because there is no light in them. It's a deceiving, lying voice. Listen, Satan is a master of his craft. He's a master of not witchcraft, deception craft. Okay, he's a master of lying craft. He's a master of it. He was able through his lies to lead the mighty angels that had beheld the face of God for an undefined period of time into treason against the Most High. 
into rebellion against God. How, what can he, what, come on, what can, he, what can he do against you and me? Come on, our only place of safety is the word of God. <laughs> see, see, the Lord, the name of the Lord is like a high tower. The righteous, not the unrighteous, but the righteous run in. <laughs> The righteous run in and they say they trust totally in him and in his name and in his protection and his provision and his perfection. In his protection, in his provision, in his perfection. I trust in his protection as much as I protect as I trust in his perfection. I trust as much in his perfection as I trust in his provision. He's my God. He leadeth me. He leadeth me. He leadeth me. He is my God. He leadeth me. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of holiness, the one who teaches holiness and establishes us in all the ways of God is here to teach us, lead us, guide us. And if we're born of the Spirit, we'll walk in the Spirit. We'll live by the Spirit. Hallelujah. We live by the Holy Ghost. We'll live by the Spirit of holiness. We'll walk in the Spirit of holiness. We'll love holiness. When somebody comes and preaches holiness to us and says, renounce ungodliness and worldly lust, our heart just leaps on the inside of us. Saying, somebody's declaring it like it is now. It's true. But unfortunately, Satan is loose for a little season. Unfortunately, Satan is loose for a little season. Father's always separating goat from sheep, wheat from chaff. He's always separating. Light from darkness, light from truth. Those whose hearts are right and those whose hearts are not right. God will allow a place for people to run to. In Revelation chapter 20, we read about how that after a thousand years of men living under the beautiful and glorious reign of Christ Jesus himself, along with uh, all of his resurrected saints, which uh, I am in the number. Hallelujah. I hope you are too. You're going to have to know for yourself though. And then you're going to have to have yourself some witness. The Holy Ghost is going to have to bear witness of you. The Holy Ghost or Spirit of Holiness will bear witness of you whether or not you've been born of the Spirit. Amen. Amen. After living a thousand years with the angels of God and the glory of Almighty God and the visitations of the Father. My, my, my. You know, that's going to be the high point then. The high point now is when we, when we with broken hearts and willingness, well, willingness to be cooperative with the Holy Ghost and a willingness to be obedient, submit ourselves and see what we call a mighty move of God, a latter rain, to see a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, to see what we call revival that comes not accidentally, not just because of the sovereign will, will of the Father, but because it becomes our will too, which is really running very short these days. In supply of those who stand with God. Those who will come on the other side with Him and be identified as those separated from the world. The Lord says, come out from among them. Be separate, saith the Lord, and I'll receive you. Nothing's changed. People have so adopted the spirit of the world. They smell like the world. They act like the world. They look like the world. They think like the world. Just because they come to church and mix the world, try to mix the world with Jesus. When you mix the world with Jesus, you don't end up with some of the world and some of Jesus. You end up with all the world because God don't mix. When you mix with lie with truth, if you mix even just 1% lie with 99% truth, you end up with a lie by everyone's definition. Hello? 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 Ain't nobody going to tell you a 1% lie and then you're going to say to them, oh, well, you know, they told the truth. Nobody. But you want it that way for you when you stand before God. But he doesn't have false judgment. I'm here to declare to you the things of God. That's my job. I'm not, I'm not here. God's, people think God's trying to win a popularity contest. Father's not, trying to, Father's not trying to be cool. He's not interested in being popular. He's going around trying to announce God so that everybody like him. He's not trying to be liked. He's purposed to be obeyed in his mercy and his grace. He's made a way of escape so that men can escape his wrath that is coming. Somebody said, oh, I don't believe in the wrath of God anymore. He's taking care of Calvary. Well, let me just tell you right now, one day for 200 miles in the near future, Blood will flow three to four foot deep for 200 miles. For 200 miles. And all that is God's expression against sin. He's just holding it back. Right now Satan is loose for a little season. You know, one of the things that you, that you, that you just can't even imagine when you read in Revelation chapter 20 is that 
And he shall go out. And with his lies and propaganda, he's going to say, God is a hard person. He sows. He reaps where he is not sown. He gathers where he's not laid up. He's using you. Trying to control you. His lies, same lies he tells people now, or why they don't go to church, or why they go to a church that's not going to hold them accountable, or whether they right or wrong, that is not going to rebuke them, reprove them for unrighteousness sake. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, when you've been called of God, born again and called of God to live in all of his ways, you and I need a whole lot of correction. If you don't think so, let's talk after the meeting. We need a whole lot of instruction. Habakkuk the prophet said, I'll go up upon my high place and see what God will say when he rebukes, rebukes me, when he reproves me, when he corrects me, when he brings my way more into an agreement and alignment with his. Amen. That's what the Holy Ghost, the teacher of truth, has come to do to lead us and guide us into all truth. That means he's got to expose the lie, the falsehoods. He's got to show us where we've opened up doors to the enemy to allow Satan in to destroy us or to ultimately deceive us with a mixture. Because it's a, hey, look, if the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And there are many people who have darkness and they will not receive rebuke and they will not receive reproof because they don't even know who is in charge in the church. They don't know. They think that the popular person that was given some position because of his humanistic doctrine that he's in charge. No. God said in his church, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. God's got his voice. You can tell them. They act like Jesus. They talk with the authority of God. All they do is declare his word. They call people into a place called heavenly, from out of the world into a heavenly realm. You know, back to Revelation chapter 20, it, what is amazing to consider is this. The scripture says that when Satan goes out with his propaganda and his lies against God, it says that they will be gathered unto him in number as the sand upon the seashore for multitude. What is he going to do? He's gathering them to come and fight against God's servants and against God. Happens the same thing today. Anybody who has an anointing, anybody who's going to be in your face, charging you to live right and walk with God, warning you of a wrath to come, and they're going to become the enemy of the state. It's not right for such a people to live. It's always been that way. Then Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 25, they say that your master, me, that they tell, if they're telling and declaring that I am Beelzebub, which is a, a terrible manifestation of the demon spirits centered around the cult of Baal. If they say that I am the devil and have a devil, and by the devil cast out devils, what are they going to say about you? The prophets, they've always stoned the prophets. They've always hated the prophets. Isaiah, one of the great prophets that we love to read and, 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 and be in awe of his revelation. God, they sawed him in two. Out of the prophets. Paul, they cut his head off. Huh? Well, that'd be one of the first times that we could actually see where the world actually did it. Most of the time it was God's people, his church. People, you ought to have to understand, Satan goes about raising up insurrection against those who are anointed of God. He goes about raising up the intercessions of hell are easy to spot. They're easy to hear. Most people have not handled the word enough of God enough and given themselves enough to the intercession of the Holy Ghost to recognize the intercession of demon spirits that bring out railing accusations against God and His anointed. Because they're going to hate us with the same hatred they have towards Him. <laughs> you know, there's been many times that the Lord's come and consoled me and said, no, 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 don't worry about it. They're doing it to me. All you're seeing is the expression of what they do to me. That's all. They want to create ideas in their own mind. But listen, anybody who hates you hates me. Anybody that receives you receives me. He that receives me receives my father also. This is the way the papa brings it down. They say that they love God whom they haven't seen, but they hate their brother whom they have seen. They're liars. If they walk in the light as you're in the light, then they'll, they'll have fellowship with you. They'll love you. They'll have the same love. If they hear me, they'll hear you. If they won't hear you, they won't hear me. There is a company of us like that. It's true. It's not like there's just one guy standing over here in San Diego saying, Ah, oh, if you hear me, you hear God. If you don't hear me, you don't hear God. John had to bear that on his shoulders. You think that was easy? You don't think people said, Listen to him. He's a cult leader. 
Do you hear what he said? He that heareth me heareth God, and he that does not hear me does not hear God. Uh -huh. he, he had to bear the responsibility of that, because we can all be religious about it now. God's got a covenant of people that nobody's, very few people want to listen to. And oh, they're going to find, Satan's going to make sure that he piles the faults high to the ceiling. He's going he's gonna, to, I mean, look at what, look at the intercession that against Jesus. Such lies. He's a glutton and a wine bibber. A glutton and a drunkard. And, and people today, even, people today in the church actually use that as a, a, a proof text that it's okay to drink alcohol. You're nuts! You, you've completely been given over to a lie. <laughs> completely given over to a lie. Provable lie. Damnable heresies. Jesus wasn't a glutton. Big old food belly. Went a drunkard, staggering around half the time. Oh, yeah, that's right. I got minister tonight. I got to sober up. Jesus, help us. Lies. They go on all the time. Satan create lies. Fictitious stuff. Because God's people, can't, you can't touch them. You have to make something up about them. How they didn't care. I'm ministering to you today. Luke chapter 19, Matthew chapter 25. About you giving an account to God. So, uh, and you know, we're going to have a baptism here today. We're going to have a baptism right now. So how many people getting baptized today? One, two, three, four, praise God. Five, six, six, seven, seven people. Praise the Lord. That's a good number. Hallelujah. <laughs> and of course, what we like to do is we like to go right out of the public place. And it's November, so it's not as fun as it is in July. Because in July, it's hard, you know, you got to weave your way through all the crowd to get out there. And then everybody's standing there looking at you. They're on vacation. What are you doing going in the water with your clothes on? And now you got somebody pushing you under the water. Now what's going on? You know, they had to stand here in this place where we say, look, we've been baptized in the life of Jesus. See, reality, the true, true Christianity is that we've been crucified with Christ. We no longer live. We don't live our own life anymore. That's true Christianity. True Christianity is we're buried with him by baptism into his death. That's true Christianity. We don't live anymore. We don't have our own life anymore. We live the life of God. True Christianity is that we're raised up together with him. Amen. We've had a resurrection. We've got a brand new life. It's his life. We live his life. He's in us. The Holy Ghost is in us. Father's come make his dwelling in us. That's true Christianity. Hallelujah. The true Christianity is that we've been raised up together with him. And that we are alive together with him. That I'm living with him. That's true Christianity. I'm alive together with him. He's in me and I'm in him. Hallelujah. The same glory the Father gave him, he's given it to me. That's true Christianity. True Christianity is that we won with the Father, just as Jesus said, declared. In John chapter 17, verse 21 through 23. You know, I have people all the time say, I've never heard any of those things you preach. I believe that. I understand that. And I'm going to give you reference and cross-reference, and we're going to pile the scriptures up. We're going to pile them up as high as you can make them and we're going to make sure because one of the laws of proper interpretation of the bible is it cannot discover a contradiction anywhere with a conclusion that you've derived from any scripture so it's more than just two or three verses of scripture it can't contradict any other scripture either and it can't be out of context by the way hallelujah amen <laughs> i hear people all the time say oh you take it out of context i mean come on bring that pretext to me here and we'll straighten it out and get you some context amen in jesus name because we want, we, want we, we want people to be free to follow Jesus, to live the life of Jesus. It's real simple. It is real simple. You don't have to sit and get all lost in the forest of, of ideas. Just live the life of Jesus. In other words, just live the life of God. <laughs> just walk in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Come on, you is temple. Amen. Amen. How simple can that be? Say, so I want to understand what it means to live the life of Jesus. you got four Gospels. Describe it to you. And then you've got someone who God set up in front of us to model for us the Christian life and, and, set, and, and brought him into the kingdom in, in such a way to where he was the perfect model, better model than Peter, because he didn't get to walk with Jesus in Jesus' earthly ministry. He was antichrist during Jesus' earthly ministry and was one was born in due season. After that, Jesus was sent upon high, so he's a perfect model Christian, telling us how this is how it's supposed to look and how, how he's supposed to walk, and I'm not able to do this because I was walking with Jesus like the other disciples. I'm able to do, do this because I've been born again and full of the Holy Ghost, so that Jesus himself baptized me in, in his ministry. 
Can I tell you about true, true Christianity? Yes. Sure. True Christianity is that you raised up together with them and seated in the heavenly realm. Yes. That's true Christianity. Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> now, why don't you meditate on that for a little while? Why don't you meditate on the more than 700 verses of Scripture that tells you to joy and rejoice as a command? No, there's 700 scriptures tell you to joy and rejoice in God. And somebody finds one verse of scripture that says, blessed they are mourned. Don't understand what it says. And, and puts all the 700 on hold because they can relate to mourning. Give me a break. It's deception. Get yourself, get yourself in the joy right now. Get yourself in the light of his love. If you walk in the light as he's in the light, you have fellowship with people like me. If you don't have fellowship with people like me, it's because you're in darkness. It's true. Boy, everybody quits. Everybody got silent really quick. You notice that volume goes right down. Well, does that tell me you don't like me or something? Am I getting a hidden message there? Uh-oh. Oops. Discovered. I mean, you come to the light. The light makes manifest. Everybody that is in the light reproves, for the light reveals. Oh, hallelujah. That's Jesus' message. I'm personally very happy about turning on the lights. I can't help it that you got a den full of cockroaches and you embarrassed. We're going to get you cleaned up and move you into a new house. Where when you turn on the lights, there's nothing in there but good stuff. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. God's trying to give us a new life and then teach us how to walk in it. Amen. The Holy Ghost is the only one who's got the manual. Well, here's the manual. But the Holy Spirit's the only one who can teach the manual to us. Okay, how does this life work? You know, there's those people always trying to build something or operate something without reading the manual first. It's a, sh it's, you know what? It's a train wreck. And the more complicated it is, the bigger the train wreck it is. <laughs> I just see somebody hopping in a 747 without reading the manual at all. No training, just hopping in. And then you're going to get in with them. Watch out. It isn't going to turn out good. Hey, Father gave us his most glorious life beyond anything that any of us would have any understanding or ability to ever live. And so, therefore, he gave to us the Holy Spirit himself to come be in us and walk alongside of us, to show us, to instruct us. And I'm telling you, people, there's going to be a lot of the Holy Ghost saying, look, you can't do that no more. That's right. He's told me that many times. <laughs> you can't do that no more. This is how you're supposed to live. You don't allow that stuff in your life. I've called you into a place of being in me. I've called you into a place to where that you could be my witness. You could be the witness of what it's like to be in heaven. <laughs> Hallelujah. People, I just want God to accept them how they are. That if God accepted you how you are, heaven would be the hell you're living in now. God's going to have a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells only righteousness and there's no sanctification in the grave. Sanctification happens because you've been redeemed by the blood and made a new creation. Good people think that the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse them from all sin while they continue on in sin. No, that is false. That is true. Somebody who says, look, I'm, I'm, I'm washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, and so it doesn't matter what I do. God understands. We all professional sinners. That is the definition of presumptuous, willful sin. There's a big, giant difference from someone who's born again and trips up and stumbles into sin because they don't know how to stand against the wiles of Satan because they've not matured enough to walk as the overcomers that God has given us the power to do. I write unto you, young men, because you're strong. And the word of God abides in you, and you have defeated Satan at every point. Is something that is very rare in the earth today, but it's always been rare. But if there's ever a time that God's going to raise up an army... Uh, people who know how to walk with him, it's now. It's in these last days. It's now. And Father's given you an opportunity. And you can, you can be, you could be the king of the world. You could have an, a, a possibility, an opportunity, a, a reason to have the greatest anointing of anybody that has ever lived. But if you're not willing to walk in obedience and faithfulness to God, none of it will be revealed in your life. And I, so I want to talk to you out of the parable of the kingdom that is revealed both in Luke chapter 19 and Luke chapter 25 concerning the talents that the Lord gave. Just concerning, I, I don't like to use that word. I, I've been in churches where they're talking about talent. Talent is a measure of weight, not a skill of singing or what is your talent. Okay, there's a real 
you know, breakdown in communication at that juncture. When somebody wants to now use that as a means by which they're going to give some homiletics of, of, of the Word of God, some application of specifically how is this applied to your life. Talent is a measure of weight. In Matthew chapter 25, God gave, gave a measure of financial means, whether it was a talent of gold, a talent of silver, a talent of copper, none of us know. And then in, in, in Luke chapter 19, the Lord gave to them a pound, which would be, uh, let's just say it was the, the highest level of trade commodity of the day, about three months worth of wages, okay, just to try to normalize things. And, of course, that's a fraction of a talent, okay? <laughs> so, are you with me? And so in Matthew, rather, just Luke chapter 19, there was 10 servants. So here's what goes down. The Lord, he says, I want, he's getting ready to go to Jerusalem. He's getting ready to be crucified. He's getting ready to go away. He's getting ready to receive a kingdom, and he's getting ready to go away. He's getting ready to be made king, receive a kingdom, and go away. Are you with me? Now, there's going to be, in, in the Lord in chapter 19, uh, Luke chapter 19 brings up that there's people that say, we don't want this guy to be king. Huh? Did you know that there's a lot of people who don't want God to be king? And that's why they don't want me to be pastor. And anybody like me, they don't want me to be pastor, and they don't want them to be pastor that are representing the king, because we're standing here and saying, worship the king. He's king of kings and lord of lords. He is worthy of all obedience. Right. We, we See, we believe that sin is treason. We believe that covenant breaking is treachery. We believe that telling a lie is damnable and incurs the wrath of God to a lake of fire forever. We don't dilute nothing here. Uh-oh, now we're getting quiet again. Here we go. We're getting, see, everything's shutting down. Ooh, you can feel the, you know, it's like the air gets sucked out of the room. Oh, my God, is it, could it possibly be telling the truth? We're telling the truth. Sin is treason. <laughs> People act like breaking faith with God is something that's common. No. It's not common. It's not, well, it is common. It's supposed to be. not supposed to be common. Adam was cast out of the garden and of his presence. You listen to me now. You've been listening to lies. Until you get in the truth and submit yourself to truth, you're wide open. You have no filter against lies. Wide open. People's, people have, people's imaginations run wild. They run wide open to every little suggestion of Satan. Every little voice that's in the prince and power of the air. The atmosphere is filled with the voice of hell. The good news is that the Lord has come to give us... His power, the strength of His power and of His might, that we may stand against all those voices. He's given to us His total equipment of His power and authority so that we can stand against every trick of Satan. Isn't that good? You know, it's like the Lord gave me a word, I guess it was last Sunday. You know, yeah, Satan goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, but God's eyes go to and fro seeking whom he may empower. Father's looking to empower some people. But you're going to have to come all the way over. You're going to have to completely break free of everything that belongs to this world. Say, I don't want it. I don't want to be in it. I don't want a taste of it. I don't want to handle it. I'm tired of communion with devils. I'm ready for communion with the Holy Ghost and with the Lord Jesus Christ and the Father. The holies of holies is still just as holy as it's ever been. And God's invited you in. And it's not visiting. You're not just supposed to come visit on Sunday morning. It's a place to live. I've entered into the holies of holies by the blood of Jesus Christ. As a priest, as a king, as a redeemed son of God, I walked right in through the veil of his broken body and, and torn flesh. It was broken and torn and, uh, at, at the whipping post and, and opened up for me at Calvary's tree. I'm telling you, if he could be made sin for me, I could be made righteousness for him. I mean, if he can champion my cause, I'll champion his. I'm not going to sit still as the voices of lies cry out against God. And just, and just, just be silent. Oh, don't argue with them. All they want to do is argue. I'm going to not be silent. I'm going to lift up my voice against those who bring a reproach against my master, against the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Look at all that he suffered to bring me the message. To love me. I'm willing to partake in that suffering that he bore for me. To be, have fellowship with the one at Calvary. The person who actually started what's called the voice of the martyr. He was in a Soviet nation when, when um, communism took over. And they come into his town. And he was a, he was, his background was a, being a Jewish person who had given his life to Jesus. 
He was a Holy Ghost preacher. And he lived to just recently. And uh, he was standing there. And they were, as, as the representative of the Communist Party was railing on Christianity and Jesus and the Bible. And saying how much, how it's just Aesop's fables. And it's fictitious. And it's all nonsense. And it's all just to control people. And, and his wife turned to him and looked at him and said, are you going to stand there and take that? Both of them knew for him to get up and say anything was going to cost him his life. Ultimately, the Lord spared him. And he, I think, I, I don't remember whether he, sp- whether he spent 12 years or 18 years in prison. I think, I think in his particular case, he spent 18 years in prison taking up the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. What you going to do? Huh? There's all kinds of voices. You want to hear voices speaking against God and his anointed? <laughs> You'll find thousands of them. And all it is is all it is is God's allowed a place for people to run to if they've got it in their heart to run in treason against God. There's a place. Satan is loose for a little season. He goes about with his lies. There's it's just a little season right now that he's loose. And I know that I'm talking about something when I refer to Revelation 20 that's going to happen in the future. But it's happening right now. Satan is doing the same tricks. He just does, say, he does the same trick over and over again. He lies against the truth. The same trick that he did in the Garden of Eden, he's doing right now to you. The same lies and accusations and propaganda that you read about that he brought forth in Ezekiel 28. He's bringing forth right now at this time. The same things he said about Jesus, he's saying about the ministers of Jesus today. And all you need to do is get yourself a bit of a relationship with God, and you'll be able to discern those lying accusations against God and his anointed. And you'll rise up to and say, no, I'm not taking this. I'm not allowing these lies against my master, against the king of kings, against my redeemer, against the one who loved me so, to stand. I'm going to rise up. I'm going to get to Luke 19 here in a minute. I'm going to show you the accusation here in just a minute. Of Satan, his lies, of why people don't move forward in God. It's in these two stories, in these two parables. Two different parables. One, ten servants, all receive the same measure. One, three servants, this receive two, three different measures. I'm going to bring this to you. But I want to tell you a story, another story before I get into this. Because I want to I grab you. Um, I know of this prophet guy, and uh, he had been in a meeting, and, and those of us who are, you know, are allowed of God to minister to people, run devils off, break strongholds out of people's lives, we really can relate to this and understand this, but he had just cast out some devils out of this person. The devils, of course, immediately had gone out of this person, the person was set free. Well, he goes into a vision later on, and he's there in this vision, and these devils, when he cast the devil out of the person, he was now able to literally see these devils ran, went out of the room, the room that the person that was there, he was there ministering. Remember, this is later. This is not at the time. He's now having a vision about the events that took place. And so, Satan comes and looks through the window at him standing in that room where the devils had been cast out. And, and with, a real, with a very ferocious, angry look, saying, I'm coming in there, and I'm taking care of you. Look, you know. And he comes into the, the room, and he, he, they basically kind of stand off like two boxers. And then Satan goes to flattering him, saying, you know, you really are anointed. This amazing power and gifting of God that is in your life. Starts flattering him. So this is the fight. I'm going to flatter you now. I'm going to tell you how wonderful you are. And, of course, the prophet knew what was going on. He said, you foul spirit of hell. You lie against the truth. I bind you now. And he went on with the, these kinds of activities. And uh, he said to him, he said, you want to know how I deceived the angels? You want to know how I overthrew the mighty host standing around God so they'd follow me and not follow him? And immediately he folded himself into a great accordion. And he began to sing. And he began to sing praise to the living God. Praise to the Almighty, saying three whole stanzas of praise and honor and glory to the Almighty who reigns above all others. 
And he was just crying out, let all creation worship him. Let all creation bow before him, adore him, and worship me too. Just one line. One phrase, one phrase, and three full stanzas of music with a chorus. One line, and worship me too. What happens, dear people, is these lies and these tricks of Satan are going on in subtle ways where people want to be, they don't want to hear what the prophet has to say. Ahaz is ready to go up against the Syrian army. And his 400 prophets declared to him, Oh, you're great. Oh, you're wonderful. Oh, God is with you. Oh, you're going to defeat the Syrians. Oh, your majesty. Oh, your power. Nobody can throw down. Josephat says, Hey, man, can we get, can we get another voice here? You've got 400 prophets, but they all from the same denomination. Is there not a prophet of Jehovah? Is there not a prophet of the Lord? And he goes, yeah, but he's never got anything to good to say. I hate going over there. Anytime I go to that church, I feel all condemned. Uh, he's just controlling. He's abusive. He's hard. He don't listen to nobody. He just laying it out there. Whatever he says God is saying, just lays it out there. That's 1 Kings 22. I'm going to get to Luke 19, Matthew 25 here in just a minute. I'm setting you up. Never gotten anything good to say. Malchias' name. <laughs> so I said, we'll just go ahead and call him anyways. And so they brought Malchias in. It says, Malchias walks up, and they said, uh, and so of course, you know, you got people say, listen, everybody's saying good stuff about the king, you say it too. You know, they're, they're kind of prepping him. I have people tell me, oh, you know, I'm bringing so-and-so to church tonight, and they give me their history, and they give me their background like they're trying to prep me. <laughs> I've been in this situation. Hey, listen, now, um, you're up next here in ministry, but I just want you to know what the landscape, what the demographics are here. And I'm looking at them while they're telling me, I'm not interested in the landscape and the demographics. I'm going to say what God put in my mouth to say. I, I'm here where I'm at right now in relationship with him that I have. Because I said I devoted myself to saying what he put in my mouth to say. Amen. So Malchiah gets there and he goes, now that he's been prepped, they say, he always tells them, I'm going to say what Papa puts in my mouth to say. And, uh, of course, he, wasn't, he didn't have the right to call Father, father at that time. He just said, Lord, Jehovah, what he puts in my mouth to say. And he gets there and he says, yeah, go ahead, man. Go out there and prosper. Go out there and defeat everybody. And the king looked at him and said, now you tell the truth. Because see, even somebody who wants to be lied to knows that they're being lied to. Huh? Even those folks who don't want to hear the truth, they want to hear the lies. They know they're being lied to. Huh? They just don't like it because they're not going to change. They want to get into company. People, come, people leave my, my meetings all the time and go get counselors. <laughs> they, go get, they don't just go get psychiatrists. They go get ministers. Please tell us that he's wrong. You don't know what he said in the meeting, and I'm feeling totally conflicted. And they get all these people around. Yeah, he's bad. Bad, bad, bad. Yeah, I know. I heard about him. Bad. And so Micaiah goes, I'm going to tell you what happened. I'm going to tell you what happened. The Lord was standing in his holy place in his temple, and he said, how can I destroy Ahaz and break him down? How can I bring him into a place of slaughter and take him to be destroyed by the kings of Syria? I'll send forth, and one, person came, one angel came up and said, I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets. And then I, he has a, see, see, I told you, see, I told you. When he starts telling the truth, he's like, I didn't think good to say about me. I told you. And then he lays it out there. You know what they did with Melchiah? They called him. He didn't call them. They asked him for the word. He, they came to his meeting, as it were. He didn't go to their meeting. They put him in prison, fed him with the bread of affliction. Put him in, in the strongholds and chains. Because he tells the truth. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. People will still put the masses, humanity, they're just unique ways to do it. 
still, God's servants are still stoned. They just stoned with words and accusations. Still stoned, nonetheless, still stoned. And God will account it the same. That all the blood of the prophets, when you participate with that stuff, all the blood of the prophets that have been destroyed by the same attitudes come on your own head. It's not just one guy. You can't get ju- you cannot get justification for, for hating and despising the authority that God has placed in the church. Because they tell you the truth. People are always looking for someone else to blame. I want you to look at these couple of verses of scripture with me real quickly. And I want, to, want you to turn with me to Luke chapter um, 19. And So the Lord now comes, and and, I, and, of, and of course we know that really he's talking about faithfulness. It, he, he points to every person in his kingdom. He's given everybody in his kingdom a charge. Father expects you to not live your life, own life anymore. You've signed up to live his life. Father's not going to say, hey, you did good. You bought a house. You paid the mortgage. You had a nice car. You took good care of your family. Oh, wonderful. And good, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the rest. It was. You went to school. You got a degree. My goodness, you were expert in what you did. Everybody adored you. My goodness, come on in. He tells you to lose your life. He's told, he's told you, he said he's given each one of us a responsibility because the pound or the, or the measure of weight called a talent all represents that which belonged to him. He took that which he had and he gave it to his servants and said, Occupy until I come. And the things which he had was the ministry of the Holy Ghost to go everywhere preaching the gospel to set the captives free to reach the lost. You know, my dear friend Tim Hall was with Reinhard Bunke one day and you know, they both, they both have such great anointing. It's Tim's the Reinhard Bunke of the South Pacific. Reinhard Bunke is the Reinhard Bunke of Africa. And, and Tim, you know, both of them are older in God and have done great exploits in God. And Tim, Tim said to, to Reinhard, said, Reinhard, you know, I've always admired your ministry, always just been so blessed and inspired by what God's done through your life. Please tell me, give me something, give me a word, what's really burning in your heart of, of where we're going and you know, what, what is it all about kind of, you know, question. And Reinhard Bunke leaned forward and said, souls, souls, and more souls. In his way of saying things in a very radical way. See, the Lord took all that he had, all that belongs to the kingdom of God, all that he demonstrated and showed us when he went about destroying the works of the devil, setting the captives free, giving this empowerment that says, anyone who believes, you'll cast out devils, you'll, you'll speak with new tongues, you'll take up serpents, if you drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm you. You'll lay hands on the sick and you, they shall recover these works and greater works. you tread upon scorpions and serpents and above all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you, on and on and on. And he left it, he distributed them to his servants, you and me. And those who have lived for the past 2,000 years ago, and he went, for the past 2,000 years, and he went away into a far country, heaven. And he's, he's, we are waiting for his return, and he's going to come. And when he returns, and you and I are going to have a parousia, the coming of the Lord, at different times more than likely. Because there's not a single soul in here that knows how long they're going to live. And the moment that you die is the time that you're going to give an account. It's really his coming, his parousia for you. And he's going to bring you to an account. And he's not interested in all that you've done and all that you've, how you've worn yourself out for you. That where when it comes, when it comes to reading the word and giving yourself to the spiritual things of relationship, when it comes to keeping his charge and going and giving yourself to functioning and flowing in an anointed Holy Ghost realm, which is an act of your volition, I'm telling you, you listen to me. It's a determination that you stand against all hell to lay hands on the sick. It's not some passive act 
that you just suddenly had an opportunity. And so because you just suddenly had an opportunity, it fell in your lap, and it seems to be convenient you do it. I'm telling you, it costs you everything to do that, which God has called us to do. But everything should be easy, since you don't live your own life anymore. And this is what Jesus is talking about in, Matthew, in Luke chapter 19, Matthew chapter 25, when he said he took that which belonged to him, and he gave it to his servants and said, Occupy with my things until I return. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. He told us exactly what to do, appointing every one of us an a, 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 a ability and the, and, and the anointing according to our, what he individually decided concerning uh, us. What he decided concerning us rather individually. Hear me. Because you're going to give an account. What are you doing? What are you doing? One who has given one pound came and said, I've got ten. He's a good be over ten cities now. You're faithful. Because I've given you the divine ability to increase. Nineteen is very unique because nineteen, everybody's given the same amount to start with. is a leveling floor. No one's, no one's looked at as having more ability to, than another in Luke 19. Everyone is equally given the same amount. Huh? But there's Reinhardt Bonkies. Huh? There are people that take it to the limit, man. Huh? That say, I don't care. We're, d- d- uh, with total abandonment, I'm doing this thing in God. Huh? They find a consecrated place to live. The Tim Halls, the Carlos and the Condias. I can get down the list. Then another comes and I earned five. I've increased fivefold in that which you gave me, the charge that you gave me. I made nothing else about my life more important than doing your will, Father. The charge that God gives you in the church is something that goes way beyond any opportunity that men could ever give you, even if they assigned you to be the president or prime minister or king. And you can prioritize those things. Your heart's not right. Or you're still so immature you haven't understood the value of that which Father has entrusted unto you. I mean, it's, I, find some, I find people don't even have time to go get involved in the Word. They're always talking about myself. How can I serve myself? They want to wear themselves out for themselves instead of wear themselves out. You've got one life to live, dear people. Wear yourself out for Jesus. Amen. Because if you don't wear yourself out for Him, you're going to wear yourself out for you. And there's no reward there. And there's no well done, my good and faithful servant there. But it's always, somebody's always ready to blame somebody else. It's not my fault. Listen to this. Listen to this. It's not my fault. You ready for it? It's not my fault. Here's why I did it. I did it, Lord, because you are hard. Because I was afraid of you. Everybody gets around you afraid of you. We bring the dogs. They go to the bathroom. My dog, you know, goes to the tree, rather. Everything's afraid of you. Everybody's trembling around you because you're hard. You're unreasonable. You're controlling. You don't care. You're uncaring. These are the words, words, synonym words that you could use for the Greek words that are there. Hard, austere, man. Therefore, I want you to know, the things you gave to me was of no real interest to me. I had my own fish to fry, my own business to take care of, my own goals to accomplish, my own family to tend to, my own field to plow, my own oxen to prove, my own life to live. Jesus said, you're not worthy of me. Anybody who says, comes to the altar call and says they're going to follow me and they go to take care of their oxen, they go to take care of their ground, they turn back to even bury their dead. Not worthy of me. Uh Uh-oh. Oh, I told you, I told you about going over there. I told you, you won't leave feeling good. I told you, we came to church to feel good. I've had many people say this to me. We came to church to feel good. We felt worse than what we did when we came. I'm like going, praise God. We had a move of the Spirit. You recognize you weren't doing what God called you to do. And that you're going to have to lose your life so that you might find it. You're going to have to be willing to go to the cross and be crucified that you might live. You have forsaken all. And now you're having to come and confront the reality that you have not forsaken all. <laughs> I'm doing my job. What am I supposed to do? 
Somebody said, oh, it's a con- culture of condemnation. Yeah, that's one of the things they say about God. That's why an innumerable, as a number of the sand upon the seashore, will run to the place that they've been given when Satan is loose for a little season. It's not, it's not a culture of condemnation. It's a culture of, you ain't right. Get right. Change. That's what it's a culture of. You're not right. Now get right. I give you the power to change called repentance. People want to say, in a humanistic society, under the influence of the voice of demon spirits, don't tell me I'm wrong. Who do you think you are? Telling me I'm wrong. Who does he think he is? He's controlling. I've been called King Saul so many times. I'm suppressing the Davids all over the place. Yeah, well, come on, where are those Davids at? That I can see that, that, that I'm suppressing. Please, I, <laughs> my goodness. Yeah, it's, it's the lies of hell. It's the intercessions of Satan. It's because when you open your door to commune with devils, they are going to run over top of you. They are going to drive you away from the presence of the Lord. They are going to make sure that you don't listen to truth because they want their damnable lies and their damnable heresies. Hey, listen, humanism will not abide or will not tolerate. They that believe shall be saved, and they that do not believe are damned. What? I see a new kind of hatred arising now, which I heard the old men talk about when I was a little guy. The old preachers and pastors and prophets, when I was a little guy, they talked about this hatred that would arise, for we will be hated. By all nations for his name's sake, a thing that has not happened yet. A new hatred would arise, and I never realized how it would arise. It is arising because the church is empowering the secular world to hate us. The church is saying, there's nothing wrong with homosexuality. There's nothing wrong with adultery. There's nothing wrong with drinking alcohol. There's nothing wrong with smoking pot. There's nothing wrong with getting high. Somebody said, why is it that these people... These preachers and these people smoke pot and drink alcohol and snort cocaine. I said, because they don't have the presence of God in them. The Spirit of the Lord has departed. And instead of having David around who's anointed to soothe their pain, they use alcohol and cocaine. I know one famous preacher, another famous preacher said to him, said, hey, I heard you went with two Playboy bunnies down to that big conference you did in Australia. Is that true? He said, yeah, well, I'm not going to lie to you. Yeah, they're really beautiful. And then everybody's saying, oh, feel the anointing. Woo, praise God. Ichabod. No glory there. An anointing, no anointing there. It's the anointing of hell. Is that what Satan has? So it's what demon spirits like to do. That's why people live. They sit down to eat and they rise up to play. They look like they sit down to feast with the Lord at his table. And they rise up to in, be involved in demon spirits. They go out to commit adultery. They go out to commit fornication. They go out to be involved in every kind of worldly lust. The proof is there. The proof is in your life. You know. I was talking to somebody the other day. He said, well, look, preacher, come on. tell You know, I'm, I'm anointed of God. Tell me, what's so wrong with me living with my girlfriend? We're going to get married eventually. I said, here's what's wrong with it. God said he will destroy your soul in hell because he calls it treason, sin, in other words, iniquity. He calls it that which is of the devil. Ah, you just legalistic. Oh, yeah. Any, any walking with God in obedience is now defined as legalism. There's a new kind of hatred now. And that this new kind of hatred is it's these conservative, fundamental, radical Christians are just like ISIL. They have no tolerance for anybody. All they are is hate, hate, hate. Oppose, oppose, oppose. Don't want to give room for any other expression but the one that they believe in. Watch. It's rising. It's rising. It's on the rise. It's being empowered. When Brian Houston 
of Hillsong's and all of his leadership can go on record of saying we're not taking a stand against homosexuality. When they can write songs with a beer in one hand and a guitar in the other hand and everybody's high on singing it, give me a break. I've never sang those songs. I've never felt the anointing. Not the anointing of heaven. I felt the anointing of men. Huh? The same one that John Lennon would sing in. Or anyone else. Huh? Or Eric Clapton or all these other guys. <laughs> Give me a break. Just because it got Jesus in it. <laughs> there was one guy they made a big fanfare about. He rebelled against his pastor in Australia. I know this, the inside story on this. He rebelled against his pastor. He would not listen to his pastor. He was living in sin. His pastor got after him. He goes over to Hillsongs, tells Hillsongs guys over there. I'm just laying it out here. I'm just going to go ahead and just say it because it's just corrupt from the top to the bottom. He goes over and says, oh, I got cancer. And then they make a big deal out of it. He writes a song. And then it comes out. His pastor comes and says, he doesn't have cancer. He's lying to you. And he wrote the song that everybody started singing. And you sang it too with your hands worshiping. Going, oh, oh, oh. It was written in a lie under a false pretense by somebody trying to get famous. Nuts. Demonic. No, I know these things. I just so happened, it's like I felt like God grabbed me one day and pulled me up by the hair of the head and said, come here, son of man, and set me right down in the place called the holy place so I could see all the rottenness that people were doing in his name. It's nuts. And then I watched people go run here and there and start saying all these lies and partip- participating with all this damnable stuff. I, I recently heard and read where someone, some person said, oh, I'm a Catholic now. Yeah, go ahead. Out of your own mouth, you'll condemn yourself. Why? Because you want to rebel against the people of the Lord and the servants of the Lord and just looking with your, the same web that captured you like a spider that, that, that weaves its web to ca- ca- catch a fly. Huh? It's be, be now spun through you to catch others. People, I'm going to tell you right now, when your heart's right, you'll understand it anyways. Huh? You're not looking for a place to go and run so you can work iniquity. Uh, it doesn't matter how many people tell you God's not true, that God's a liar, that the truth of the salvation that you've read from the Word of God is wrong. It doesn't matter how many people say, you, you know, you, you're on a foundation, you can't be moved. You're willing to give your life, lay down your life. doesn't matter how many people bring a reproach and accusation against God and His anointed. doesn't matter. Say how controlling we are, how hard. Here we go, you're listening. They didn't do anything in the kingdom. They didn't do anything in the kingdom. Tearing down the kingdom, bringing people into deception. Out there on the street, bringing people into deception. Bringing in the same rebellion and same bondage that they themselves are in. Oh, they use Jesus' name. It's just bondage. Are you listening to me? But I feared you because you are a hard man. And you're unfair. You take up where you did not lay down. You're cheating. You're controlling. You're taking advantage of people. Hear that? You reap where you did not sow. Pretty radical, ain't it? Go over to Matthew chapter 25. Show you the same kind of response. This time the Lord distributes to each man according to their individual ability. To one he gives five, to another he gives two, to the other one he gives one. But once again, whether it's a person receiving the same as others... And everybody's on the same leveling field or whether it's people receiving now. Wait a minute. Maybe you got a little bit more than what you were able to handle. I'm going to give you even less. So now everybody, we're going to be on an equal playing field. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, people, human beings are all the same. I said human beings are all the same. I want you to know, God destroyed the earth because the imaginations of men's heart were only wicked continually. After that, he destroyed the earth. He looked at him and said, I'm not going to destroy the earth anymore like this. I know that the w- imaginations of men's hearts are wicked continually. I'm telling you right now, there's a prince of the power of the air that now works in the children of disobedience. And so many of God's people are coming under their influence and calling it justifiable reasoning. Godly reasoning. It's imaginations that need to be cast down. It's lies against the truth. You know, I can go through the list of where different church leaders 
are condoning iniquity. Different church leaders are taking, they're, 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 they're church leaders because they're in the spotlight. Joel Alstein needs to listen to his mama. His mama's a Holy Ghost woman. His daddy was a Holy Ghost man. He needs to listen. They got a homosexual mayor, and he goes and lays hands on her and prays over her and blesses her and says, God has raised you up for such a time as this to be a blessing to this, to this city. Give me a break. Empowers her now to then do her work against the pastors that she demands through her attorney to submit not only their sermons, but their text messages, their emails. I mean, once again, I'm trying to give you case and points that there is a new kind of hatred that is now on the rise, and the church has empowered it. Because the church is a hinderer of iniquity. The church is a hinderer of lawlessness. And we've said all things are lawful. All things are not lawful. It's taking it out of context. That is total, by definition, lawlessness, which is the same. Anomia in the Greek language, if you need it. And it literally means iniquity. To say all things are lawful. Murder's lawful. Homosexuality is lawful. You name it, it's all lawful. Paul's talking about kosher food. He's talking about whether or not it's okay to have some bacon for breakfast. Praise God. <laughs> I was with some holy men the other day, and they said, well, I don't, they, I said, they said, we don't eat ham, and we don't, we don't eat, and they're trying to say they don't eat pig. I said, you don't know what you're missing. You telling me you don't have bacon for breakfast? Give me a break. And one of them said, yeah, that bacon sure is good, ain't it? Yeah, I said, I liberate you right now. They call nothing common or unclean. Hey, if it was if it was sacrificed to animals, I mean to God, these animals were sacrificed to idols. Hey, it may not be expedient because you might harm a a, a, per, a, a brother or a sister whose conscience are weak, knowing that that they saw that meat offered to that idol, that goddess Diana, and now you're eating it, and their whole culture dictated that when you eat that, you're communing with that demon spirit. You're taking that demon spirit, or you're taking the interaction with that idol into your own being. It's an act of worship. That's all it's talking about. All things are lawful. Come on, people. Come on, people. God has given you this gift of his life. It ain't about whether you can sing or whether you can write. It ain't about what skills you were born with because of your genetics, whether you can lead good or whether you can follow good. And nothing about that. God regardeth no man's person. He's talking about this opportunity he's given to us when he gave us the privilege of being born of the Spirit. The gift of salvation. His grace where we become a new man, a new heart, a new spirit. Where your heart loves God and cleaves to the Lord. Were you excited about being chastened of the Lord? I can't believe how he's always correcting everybody. It's a culture of condemnation. Well, the Lord said that all the sons that he receives, he chastens, he rebukes, he reproves, he corrects. What's wrong with you? You're so rebellious and full of, full of pride that you don't want to be corrected. You resent correction. You want to go to some place where everybody can live and let live and no one's going to say that anybody's wrong. We're just all good. There's a power on the inside of you that has already made you successful. God's already said, I bless you. Give me a break. What power are you talking about anyways? And what blessings are we referring to? Break it down here just a little bit because I'm confused with the context. As you're standing there looking at that homosexual that's not right with God needs to repent. You listen to me. Without a revival, if men have their way, a message like this would be caused to issue a warrant for arrest. Because of the humanistic power, there are new messiahs on the rise right now. That people are following that are doing signs and wonders right now. Right now. 
I'm not even, I'm not going to give you their names. Right now, people are following them. Some, one, one's in Nepal. One's running around America right now. And they're, bringing, they're saying to bring all religions together. They're saying for everybody to rise up and say no to anyone who's got a message of hate. I got a message of hate right here. God hates the wicked. God hates wickedness. He got, God so loves the whole world, he gave his only begotten son. But he hates wickedness nonetheless. God so loved the world, he gave everybody an opportunity. But his wrath abides upon the children of disobedience. That's just the truth. People, we're going to have to have a revival. And you're going to have to recognize that you are giving support to someone right now. You are either giving support to God and to his kingdom by your deeds, by your behavior, by your attitudes, by your action. Or you're giving support to the kingdom of darkness. You're, you are supporting and championing the cause of one side or the other. God, as I ministered to you last Sunday, raised up champions that made intercessions. Those like Noah, those like Abraham, th those like Samuel, those like Daniel. God, those like Jesus that made, that made a difference for their generation. That, that changed the world, that, that subdued kingdoms. It stood there for all mankind. The Lord looks in Isaiah 59 and he saw that there was no one to stand in the gap. There was no one to take up justice. Jeremiah chapter 5. There was no one to seek righteousness and stand for the cause of God. And the scripture says in Isaiah 59 that God was bewildered that there was not one. God's got one champion, Job. Got one perfect man. One righteous man in the earth. Jesus. Satan, when it says he's going to throw throughout the earth, he's bragging. That I've been going looking around. And it doesn't say this, but this is what is in, this is what is basically implied. They all following me. They all following me. Yeah, it got so corrupt in Israel that God had to say by his prophet, There's none righteous, no, not one. Everyone has turned to their own way. Huh? But that's not the way it's supposed to be now, people. We are supposed to be returned unto the shepherd and, shepherd and bishop of our soul. Yes. We are supposed to be those people who, who counted the cost. We, we counted the cost. He said, unless you lose your life, you cannot be my disciple. And he said, let me tell you what I mean. If a person's going to build a tower, he's going to sit down and he's going to examine whether or not he has enough money to do it and finish. Otherwise, he doesn't complete the job and people make a mockery out of it. If a king is going to make war against another king, he's going to sit down and he's going to make reason whether or not with 10,000 he can defeat that with 20. Otherwise, he'll send amb ambassadors to sue for peace before while they're still a long way off. Let me tell ya, you. You've got to realize, I'm calling for all of you, not part of you. That's right. what God says. You need to count the cost. I'm calling for all of you, not part of you. The kingdom's about all of you, not part of you. Who we, people that we call the fathers of the faith, Origen, Tatian, Clement of Alexander, Jerome. They believed in the ultimate reconciliation of all souls. They believed that Satan himself one day would be redeemed. They believed in reincarnation. They believed in heresies. Stack to the stack to the sky that are contrary to the ways of God and the things that Father has spoken that gives room for sin and iniquity to exist. And it's still polluting, and the root of it is still here, bearing fruit even unto this day. It's time God's people break free. It's time to be a people baptized in the Holy Ghost to say who can say, What is the chaff unto the wheat? It's time that the power of God begins to burn. And you, and you recognize that for you not to deny yourself daily is an act of treason against God. It's disobedience. It's just as much sin as anything else. He's called you to deny yourself. People live for themselves. Look at your checkbook. Look at the time you spend for you. Look at how many times you can say, oh, I'm not going to go to the meeting. You're not right with God. You will not hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. You need to change. You need to repent. You need to fall down on your face before him and let God the Holy Ghost show you what great grace has been given you. If you want to live and die and go to hell, it's your business. I understand that. But you should at least know clearly what you're deciding to do. Instead of fooling yourself and saying, I'm on my way to heaven. When in reality you're not. 
because you're not doing what God told us to do, which he clearly defined. You don't, somebody said, oh, it's your opinion. It's not my opinion. Jesus showed us. It's, it's Christ Jesus' revelation. Oh, the Bible is open for interpretation. No, it's not. What was Jesus' mother's name? What, who, what was his father's name? Almighty God. <laughs> who some supposed to be Joseph. There's no, in, there's no room for interpretation. Where did Jesus die? Huh? What city? What nation? Huh? Come on, what day? There's no interpretation there. When he died, where did he go? Huh? You to say he died, went to heaven. No, he didn't. When he died, went to hell. How long was he in hell? What happened after that? He rose up from the dead. There's no interpretation there. That's just the reality of what he did. People just want to make an interpretation when all of a sudden it comes to your responsibility of what you're supposed to do now. Now it's your interpretation. No, it's just as clean and just as clear and just as plain and just as concise. <laughs> Next time you hear the voice of hell screaming out against the servants of the Lord, rebuke them. Don't sit there and say, you know what, I can kind of see that. Yeah, you know, I saw that. Yeah. I saw him just up there screaming, spits coming out of his mouth. His face was red, pains popping out of his neck. Why does he do that? Whoa. I saw him, man. I saw him just sobbing. Every time he gets up, he's just sobbing, he's crying. I think he's, I think he's you know, he's got psychological problems. It's an emotional psychological problem. It's probably because he, no one liked him on the playground when he was in elementary school. All these... No, it, I'm not kidding you. This stuff goes on. This nonsense goes on. This lie goes on. I, I don't know. You know, I don't want to break it down any further because I could easily start getting in your space, but I'm going to leave it. If you start talking about actually how you've been processing thoughts that are not according to the Word of God, every decision you make comes right out of your head. Did you know that? It's conclusions you derive. Where did you derive those conclusions from? Information that you received. Those things that you agreed with. You better watch out because there's a whole lot of things going on, influences going on, and you're thinking that you do not have the ability to discern right from wrong in. You have to start living by the word. I told some people I love very dearly, highly educated people, people that love the Lord, and they started involving, you know, some various different child psychology and the raising of kids. I said, don't do it. It comes right out of a demonic realm. Do not do it. Because of their respect for me, they said, okay, well, we'll not do it. Even though they could not understand, but because of their respect for me, they said, okay. I said, God has given us one means by which we can survive, by which we can be successful. One light of revelation by which we can live. Everything else is under the influence of the demon spirits that are the prince of the power of the atmosphere right now working in the children of disobedience. Though they sound good, are subtle lies to ultimately destroy your soul and those whom you teach it. Don't you go teach your children some damnable heresy right out of hell, born out of a demon-possessed mind. Uh-oh. That's cause to issue a warrant for my arrest right there. I am so narrow-minded. I have no value or appreciation for all the intellectualism, for all the mouse studies and rat, rat studies that have proven these things out to be true. <laughs> We're brilliant. We're all a bunch of geniuses. Huh? Geniuses. It is derived from the word genie, which means fallen angel, a demon spirit to empower you to be able to accomplish things back in the time of Mesopotamia, during the days of Nimrod. Geniuses, for sure. Are you with me? Okay. Help us, Jesus. Insight, but from the wrong spiritual source. Father's called us. He's given us gift of salvation. He's given us his love, his provision, his protection. 
He's given to us perfection. He's given to us a grace that if we sin 490 times a day, if we repent with our heart and are willing to forgive others, he, though he being a holy, holy God, having already made provision so we don't need to sin one time, yet because of his grace and his mercy, will forgive us again and again 490 times. And yet we want to trample on his goodness. We want to act like, oh, God's full of loving kindness and tender mercies. Therefore, we're going to run right over top of him. Take advantage of him. No, in his mercy and his grace, he's made provision who's with the, for those whose hearts are right for a period of time where they grow and mature in this life. But you're going to learn how to say no to sin before you die. Right. You're going to learn how to say no to sin and you're going to learn how to say no to the devil before you die or you're going to die wrong. Amen. Because there is no sanctification in the sepulcher. The sanctification having been set apart by the grace of God, by the Holy Ghost, having been purified, by having purified our hearts through obedience unto the truth, by the blood of Jesus Christ, having now been filled with the same Spirit that God Himself possesses, the Holy Spirit by name. Father has given us more than a will. He's given us a power and a divine ability. What's happened is people have taken away the foundation for the righteous to stand. They've taken away the division between that which is good and that which is evil. That which is holy and that which is unholy. That which is clean and that which is unclean. God's raised up pastors after his own heart to show his people. And when God's people start hearing, or when people who have filled the church start hearing that they wrong, yeah, you can mistake that for a culture of condemnation. You can, you can mistake that for an angry prophet. Oh, he's just angry. Actually, I'm not at all. I'm angry against sin. I'm angry against wickedness. The angry prophets. I'm in the company of the angry prophets now. But I stand in good company. Hallelujah. I'm right there with Elijah, Paul, and John the Baptist, and Jesus. Somebody said, you better quit acting like John the Baptist. You're going to get beheaded. I said, well, Jesus got crucified. So what if I just act like Jesus? Does that mean I escape being killed? No. No, James was so radical. James, Jesus named him one of the sons of thunder. Oh, my goodness, he was radical. To get a nickname Thunder? Huh? There's a place people go surfing. It's called Thor's Hammer. You don't get that because it's just in a little... You, know, you don't get... You're not called Thunder because you got some little, you know, soft, little high, high voice. Kind of a little high and real sweet. Thunder, no. And I'm telling you right now, it didn't take long. They rose up, killed him. They would have killed his brother if he could have. They tried to. He would have killed Hallelujah. How about you? What are you going to do with your life? You going to spend it on you? What a profit you if you spend your whole life on you? Why? And then let's just take it this way: What a profit you if you gain the whole world spending your life on you? What are you going to give in exchange for your soul? You just don't understand. I'm under pressure. Who put that pressure on you? Huh? Your choices put that pressure on you. Why don't you choose to follow Jesus? What are you saying? We should quit, quit our job? Probably, if you ask. Yeah, more than likely. <laughs> Seeing as you ask, I'm sure that, that God's going right to the heart of the matter. Quit. So I'm going to just ask you, would you quit your job? If your job was actually keeping you from following Jesus, would you quit it? Huh? I'm getting one sure would. I'm getting... <laughs> Four reluctant head shakes, yes. And I'm getting uh, about a hundred mouths dropped to the chin. I mean, dropped to their chest. Would I say that? Huh? I'm going to ask you this. If Jesus was to sound, come right now with the voice of an archangel, sound of a trumpet, would you be willing to go to heaven? Would you be willing to be changed in a moment? No, 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 no. Get all excited right now. Don't get all excited now. No, -uh. no because the, both, the, both, the two are equated. So you're going to live for you just so long as you're in control. And it's time to live for you. But then when it's you know, not in control anymore and it's time to live for him, then you're going to live for No way. That's false. It's false. You gotcha. Caught. <laughs> Papa's given us a whole new life. We want you to come to understand it's so beautiful. When you, get all, when you get over into this realm of faith, 
uh, you get over in this realm of walk with him, then yeah. Then you won't take thought for what you'll wear. You don't need to. He's your provider. You've discovered he's your provider. And then you won't, you won't, you won't even matter. You, know? you won't even be taking thought. You won't make decisions based upon where you're going to stay or what clothes you're going to provide for yourself. You won't even be in the, you won't even be in the, you won't even be in the form. It's not in the equation. You're living over in a realm of divine power and glory and goodness and grace and being kept by the power of God through faith and salvation. Ready to be revealed. That's right. Come on, brother. Ready to be revealed. When we see him, we should be like him. When we, when we see him, we should see him as he is, for we should be like him. Wow. God wants to show you the pearl of great price so you'll sell everything to have it. God wants to show you a treasure hidden field so you'll get rid of all that you have and go find anything, borrow whatever you get. I've got to get this, tre- I gotta get this field. I just, listen, give me whatever you can because I promise I'll pay you back as soon as I get this field. I'll take anything I got, I'm going to sell it because I want him. He's giving you a gift of salvation. What are you doing with it? He's giving you his very own life. What are you doing with it? He's giving you his Holy Ghost. What are you doing with it? He's giving you an opportunity to know him, to be filled up with him, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge and there be filled with all the fullness of God. What are you doing with it? He's giving you an access into his presence. He's giving you a privilege to come into the holies of the holies. What are you doing with it? He's giving you an opportunity to function in all the manifest, manifest power, his presence and all the gifts of the spirit. What are you doing with it? How important is it to you? Would you stand with me? God's calling you. People, it's not a time for half measures. It's not a time for half measures. If you join the military and they send you over to Iraq or to wherever, and then you wake up one morning and decide you're going to get yourself an airplane ticket and come back to America because you're tired of being there. Because they're not being fair. Is being, are they getting, you feel like you're being mistreated. They're not really concerned for your needs. <laughs> they're going to come get you and they're going to throw you in jail. Because there's such a thing as order. There's such a thing as commitment. You signed up. You signed up. You made commitments. Nothing to do with legalism. It has to do with commitment has to do you signed up for the call you sat down and you counted the cost you said this is who i want to be i want you to decide today who you're going to serve if you're going to go to hell go ahead and live like it full on out might as well get everything you can get out of this life i'd, I'd encourage you to go ahead and become a robber of men a robber of banks get yourself a bunch of money if that's what you're going for do whatever you got to do to live the life you've gonna, that you want to exchange your soul for because this is all you're going to get all you're going to get. You need to decide today. But this confusion, this mixture of people saying, I'm right with God because they've listened to the lies of the enemy and they've gone up against the truth of God's word to try to, 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 in order to believe it, you need to say, okay, today I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to deal with reality and truth. I'm not going to have the mixture anymore. I'm not going to play pretend anymore. People are having pretend tea parties with Jesus. Pretend relationship parties with Jesus nonsense huh come on I know people I can tell I can I can look and see the women of prayer in this place I can see people I know women that stand in this place who go to their knees in prayer and make intercession I can see it it's on you you can't it's it's you can't pretend there's an anointing that God gives people women you can live a life of intercessory prayer God will give you an anointing you can change things right from, right from your prayer room. You can, change, you can change nations from your prayer room. You can break off strongholds right from your prayer room. You know, we were just talking the other day about the condition of the church. Geneva and I, she, Geneva said, yeah. And, and, and I say this, and, and you know, it's like Pat Schatzine said, listen, Mark, you need to be out there. You, you need to come. I'll open up every door I can possible. I'll tell everybody I know to bring you into the meetings, bring you into the church. Because the situation is bad. And, and Geneva said, yeah, but we need to get people in this church to recognize the call of God upon their life. Because there's many people in this church, they, they, they're, they're, they're good people, but they don't know how to flow in the anointing. They love God, but they don't know how to move in the things of the Spirit. 
And the only thing that's going to change this nation is people who will go in the demonstration of the Holy Ghost and power. And that's, there's a price to pay for that. Peter, James, John, everyone left everything that they had. Their family, everything. Huh? Peter slammed his door on a screaming wife saying, Ah, you can't leave me. Watch. I'm following Jesus. Of course, they didn't behave themselves that way in those days. That's a new age rebellion. Back then, women were just supportive of what men were doing. What God had called them to do. The Lord says, let's forsake everything. Forsake it all. You know what? I, I'm, it is for me, sometimes I think, my goodness, it would be great if people would just forsake 10%. Come on, it's time I want to bring you to a point of decision. Who are you going to live for? Satan? Is Satan your father? Or are you going to live for God? Is God your father? Are you going to live for the devil? Are you going to live for your life in this world? Or are you going to have the heavenly vision? You decide. I want you to decide today. I want you to quit pretending. I'm going to tell you right now. If you did not listen and obey my command to follow us 90 days in, in, in reading the word of God, and you say you don't have time, you are disobedient and rebellious. I'm letting you know it's quantifiable now in your life. And it's part of the reason I told you to do it. And, and people say, but Mark, you've got to stop doing that because you can't grow a church like that. Oh, yes, I can. Because before you grow a church, you've got to get rid of everybody who doesn't want to obey. Because all they are is keeping the Holy Ghost from being, they're sitting there with their stubbornness and their rebellion and their backbiting and they're trampling our pearls underfoot. Huh? Cast not your pearls before swine. See, see, people, you can tell pigs. They don't take the values, the riches of heaven, and do with them what they're supposed to do. They don't have no, any recognition of it, the value of it. I'm not letting you alone. I'm not giving you no break. I'm not giving you no get out of jail card. We call it into another kind of life. I, I, I want my, my daughter or somebody to start doing films if the Lord should be willing and pleased. The exploits of Joshua so people could see, by and large, Joshua stood by himself. By and large, the whole company of God's people's hearts were going after idolatry. By and large, it was one man who knew how to function in an anointing and do exploits in God. And he held everybody together. Take him out of the way, everybody falls apart. That's it. Oh, God, please. Now, Lord, you did this great thing. See, you did this great thing. When he gave Jesus his only begotten son to purchase the church for himself, he did this great thing when he made a way where we could have a new heart, a new spirit, have a new outlook, a new attitude, a new force of living, a new insight. And yet so many people just want to go on and continue to live the same worldly. N nothing's going to change till you change it. Because God's already changed everything. You need to get out your monkey trap. You know what a monkey trap is? Monkey reaches into the cage to grab the banana. He grabs the banana and he won't let go of the banana. So he's trapped. He could escape any moment. All he's got to do is let go of the banana. That's where people are. That's the monkey trap. Holding on to something that is keeping you imprisoned. How easy it is to get out. You don't need no special key. Let go. If there's anything you've got to hear, you've got to hear me. You cannot live your own life in the life of Jesus too. If you want to learn, I, I was ministering to people on, on School of the Spirit on Friday night. The, few, the three people that showed up. Now, there's a little more than that. The ten people that wanted to be in the school. You're never going to function in the mind of Christ until you decide you don't want your own mind anymore. Until you want to start casting down your thoughts, until you start taking this thing to the, to the mat. They want to do it their own way and say, all these crazy ideas. And that There's a price to pay. It's absolute and complete change. It's to be conformed to the image of the Son. It's not to be conformed anymore to this world. 
is to be transfigured by the thinking different, the renewing of your mind. Let, can, can we please get out of pretend around here? Can we? I, I would like for all of you to get out of pretend, and then I'll do everything I possibly can do to go open up as many doors and churches everywhere for you to go preach and tell them about what it means to receive the life of Jesus. Instead of the life of religion. If there's any message that needs to be preached, it's to receive the life of Jesus. That's all I wanted. That's all I wanted. I want to see people come into the kingdom of God. Just like Summer's coming into the kingdom of God, I don't want them to be spoiled. Doing anything, following anybody else but people that are baptized in the Holy Ghost. Don't you follow anybody. Don't act like me. I'm tired of people getting spoiled. Tired of it. I've had one move. We had a great move of God in 1983 in this city. I mean, I've watched so many moves of God over the years. 1983, so many people coming. Never knew the Lord before. Coming into the kingdom. Children of professors at UCSD and other places. Coming into the kingdom is beautiful. And I mean, it was just a... And I know that the prayer meeting sounded like this. sounded like a win. It was just a bunch of hollering. It was amazingly wild. And the religious came along and said, Ah, oh, don't follow him, follow us. Ah, oh, this is a cult. And we, was a, we were a cult because we were crying out to God to baptize us in the Holy Ghost and power. I, I tell you right now, I'm at war against the powers of darkness. And it's time, we're just looking for some people to sign up. We're looking for some people that love Jesus more than their Betty Bye. We're looking for some people that want to serve God when it's not convenient. Because everybody wants to serve God when it's convenient. Oh, this works into our schedule. This fits in our schedule. Hey, look, Pastor, an hour of our Bible reading a day don't fit into our schedule. I just wanted to prove that to you last Sunday. I just wanted to prove it. Some of you can repent and catch up by doing two hours a week this week. You can catch up. You can repent and catch up. But if you prolong till next week, it's going to take you three hours to catch up. Then you prolong to the next week, it's going to take you four hours. And then you, you now will never join in. You've dug a hole too deep for yourself. And it's the same way of resisting the Holy Ghost. You can resist the Holy Ghost just so long and then you can't come in. You created a pattern in your life that is a stronghold. And you'll die in your sin. And you'll lift up your eyes in hell being in torment. You need an encounter with Christ Jesus and He's here. The only thing that can possibly change that is a miracle. You listening to the voices of hell that have lullabied you into a deception that you are secure, that you're safe, that it's all right, and you in peril of an eternity without God. I say you in peril of an eternity without God. Your religion will not save you. Your ideology, your understanding of God will not save you. A transformed life by the power of the Holy Ghost. One that then results in obedience that brings forth fruit. Meat for repentance. Evidence of repentance. Is all that's going to make the difference. All that's going to make a difference. God needs the people to stand up on his side. God needs the people to stand up on his side. God needs the people to stand up on his side. God needs a people that will stand on his side. Yes. Let me just make it real simple for you. The Lord's asking for everything. One day I was talking to some ministers. It was a room full of preachers. I don't know. It's a room full of preachers. Back in 1998. And they said, well, how much is it going to cost us, Pastor Mark? He said, it's going to cost you everything. Are you willing to pay? I'm talking to you right now. 
going to cost you everything. Are you willing to pay? Are you really willing to pay? Are you willing to pay? If God writes you a ticket, one-way ticket right now to the Himalayas, are you willing to go? Are you willing? Whatever He asks you to do, you're willing to do it. That's proven as whether or not you're willing to go to your knees and cry out for the lost. It's proven as whether or not you're willing to go to the highways and the byways. It's proven. Because you're not, it, it, it's, you can be in make-believe about a one-way ticket to go to Nepal. You can't be in make-believe that you haven't crossed your street to go, get, to go reach your neighbor for the Lord Jesus Christ and then get down on your knees and have power with God and prayer and intercession till the mind-blinding spirits are broke so you can bring them into the kingdom. You've got to understand the fruits of our ministry. Come on now, people. Come on. Come on. Come on now. I mean, I, I'm, just, I just, I'm so blessed with Brittany and, and the way that Brittany just goes after souls. I mean, you know, here, here she's got souls up here on the front row. Everybody can, everybody can do that. And the, and the story behind it, the, the, the testimonies behind of people who know how to reach the lost, who give themselves to praying for others, laying down their lives for others, it works the same. There are areas of your life that you've held on to yourself and you're not willing to recognize. I know how your mind will play tricks on you. Let the power of God, let the light of His grace shine upon you so that you can say goodbye to you and hello to heaven to live the life of Jesus from this time forward. It doesn't take much to lose your life. I want you to see how glorious His is. Come on. Somebody say, oh, it's condemnation. No, I'm wrestling with you to bring you to a decision to say, looky here. If you don't have the fruits, you need to get down on your face and get right with God. Quit justifying yourself. Because the Lord gave us an ability to go and do the things that he himself set himself to do to reach the lost. To see people, I, I, was telling, I was telling some folks the other day, I don't want to see anything taking away from the main thing. And the main thing is getting people to understand how to co function, operate in the Holy Ghost. Not to educate you on Bible knowledge. What are you going to do with it anyways? What are you going to do with all your education? Huh? If you're too educated, you don't probably have to have an angel of darkness come to buffet you continually like Paul did. And live a continual one trouble to the next. Are you listening to me? Peter didn't need one. He is stupid. You know what I'm saying? He didn't have nothing to boast in except for Jesus. Can you hear what I'm telling you? Can you is this just too deep for you? No, I'm, because you know what? I'm going from the, I'm right now dealing with a person who doesn't even know the Lord Jesus that's in this building right now. And there are several. All the way to the people who've been standing around in the company of God's house for a long time as they've never stepped into an anointing that produces the fruits of salvation. What's it all about? Pastor Tim said to Reinhardt. What's it all about? In the conclusion of all that you know about God, what's it all about? Souls. Souls and more souls. He didn't say, oh, we just need to go learn the Bible better. Huh? He didn't say, we need to go do this. We no, what's it all about? Souls. Souls and more souls. Don't halt between two opinions anymore. Go one way or the other. Cleave to one and despise the other. Hate the one and love the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve, you cannot have the life of Jesus and hang on to your life as well. You cannot. You cannot. You cannot. You cannot. I mean, Philip was really radical with the whole thing. When the eunuch, he, he goes and reaches the eunuch. The eunuch said, who's, you know, eunuch's reading Isaiah chapter 53, he says, who is he talking about, himself or someone else? And Philip preaches Jesus to the eunuch. The eunuch says, 
ultimately he says, what hinders me from being baptized? He said, nothing so long as you believe with all of your heart. We've confirmed too many people with divided interest. Back in the old days, no one told you you were saved. In the sense that just as soon as you came up, confessed to the Lord, and said, no, you need, you need to, let's see you walk right with God. Let's see that there's a proof that you've been saved. Because God knows the hearts of all men. Let's see the evidence, the fruits of it. We forsook that in modern times. Because now we're all so bright and brilliant about everything, you know. And we all understand legalism. <laughs> people want to have a great awakening. There's very few people that listen to Jonathan Edwards preach. Could even relate to what his sermon, his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. People would, be, people would but walk out on George Whitfield. If Jesus came in to minister, no one would stay. Increase the anointing, decrease the population. It's inversely proportional. <laughs> Come on, gonna say, I'm just saying, people, you can't judge after your own thinking. You're going to have to go ahead and let the Holy Ghost be your judge. You're going to have to give yourself over to the life of God here. I just want the Lord to deal with your heart just a few more minutes. This is an altar call, obviously. But the altar is right there, the altar of your life. It's more than you just coming and standing up here. When you come stand up here, you're pledging, saying, God, I vow my life to you. Well, if you falter and you fail, God will love you and forgive you. But you can't falter and fail and rebel and say you're right. You falter, you fail, you get right back in. Oh, I can't come to the meetings on Sunday night. Yeah, because you serve in yourself. And you got a testimony that the things of God are not important to you. Oh, I can't come on Wednesday night. Yeah, because you got a testimony that things of the Spirit of God are not important to you. Because you need to be here. You need, you need to gather yourself all the more together. As you see the day approaching, that's God's insight. That's His command. There needs to be a people who press in because there, there is a lack of the demonstration of the power of God in the land. And when you won't come and press in just by being in the meetings, I know you're not pressing in at home. Serving mammon. Serving itself. You just need to write a letter to yourself. You're not right with God. You're not on your way to heaven. You will spend an eternity in hell because you exalted yourself above God. You need to write a letter to yourself. You need to pin it up on your door when you walk in so you can see it. And when you walk out, lest you should somehow deceive yourself and say you're right with God. For if the light is in you is darkness. Oh, how great is that darkness. In other words, if you deceived, if you believe you're right when you're wrong, you are in a deception that you're not going to get out of. I'm not going to let up here this morning. I'm not going to let up. I've been here before. I've wrestled this thing before. I've busted it with a hammer before. It's not broken yet. It's not broken. It's not broken in people's lives. Self-justification is a terrible lie. Self-justification is a terrible lie. And I'm asking the Holy Ghost to shine His floodlight upon people's soul because I can't convince the mind. I can plead with you. I'm pleading with you. I'm bringing out all these things to plead with you, but only the whole, you, you, your response to the Holy Ghost is the only one, only, the only thing that will make the difference. See, you saying, Lord, let your floodlight of heaven shine upon my soul. If I've been living a lie, have I been believing a lie? Have I been living for myself? Am I living for you? Is it truly what's hindered me from participating in those things that you've empowered your church to do? I mean, just begin to lay your heart before the Lord like that. And here's what God will do. He'll begin to show you. And then that 
right there will then cause you to go to your knees. That then itself will be the motivation that causes you to begin to intercede. But until you've had that encounter with God, until there's been that level of truth, because see, God, the Holy Ghost is the spirit of truth. He's not going to mix it up with some lie, some self-justification. But when you have that encounter with truth, all of a sudden, that's what changes the sound of your prayer. Because now you're earnest. Now you see. Oh, Father, there's this thing you want to do in me. And I'm not allowing you. Oh, God, I want to allow you. Just a few more minutes. I'll just go and plead with you for just a few more minutes. Just a few more minutes. Christ Jesus is calling you. You cannot trust in the fact that you were baptized when you were a baby. That doesn't mean nothing. That means as much as a Buddhist being baptized when he was a baby. You cannot trust in what happened to you 20 years ago. All you can trust is in is Jesus Christ and a relationship, a response of obedience to him right now to say, Lord... I'm willing to do whatever you want me to do. I want to live only for you. I surrender my life. I'm not going to hold back anymore. I'm going to give my life to knowing you and walking with you and fellowship with you. I'm going to give my life to learning. I'm going to give my life to hooking up with those who you brought into my life to, to, to perfect me. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus. Right now in Jesus' name. I break off every stronghold right now in Jesus' name. If you have sin going on in your life right now, if there's disobedience going on in your life right now, if you know you're not walking right with God, Jesus Christ is calling you. He has as much forgiveness as this you need to receive. He's got as much mercy and grace as you could possibly ever want or need. He'll take care of you right now. He'll change you. He'll empower you. I'm asking you to come. I'm asking you to say, look, I'm done with sin. I'm done with opening up the computer and looking at things on the computer that are not right, that have to do with lasciviousness. I'm done with opening up... Uh, my heart and my spirit to the things that belong to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. I'm done with making excuses of why I don't need to be in the meeting and press into God. Because usually those two things are always accompanying one another. People don't come to the meeting because there's a stronghold in their life. Today, I want you to see there's a remedy for you. There's a cure for you. And I want you to come because you're saying, I'm done with it. I'm, Lord, I'm totally yours. I throw all in on you. I'm, I'm dying going to heaven right now. My life is over. I'm dying going to heaven. If it wasn't for the mercy of God, you wouldn't even be standing here. You wouldn't even be breathing right now. It's about time you recognize it. And then you'll have that much more, motiv- that much more motivation to go ahead and just say, well, Lord, I wouldn't even have this life unless you give it to me. So I'm going to go ahead and let you live through me. That's revival talk right there. That's moving in. That's moving into a place with God right there to where people can be saved and transformed. When your relationship with God becomes what it's supposed to be, people will all around you begin to give their life to the Lord all around you. They'll want to go to church where you go to church. They'll want to know the God that you know. Just the moment that you have an encounter with God and you're baptized in the Holy Ghost. So if you don't have that, if that's not your experience, I want you to know there's an experience in God, an encounter with God that is waiting for you right now. But it's going to, I can tell you this, I can assure you this, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you. The question is, are you willing to pay? Are you willing to lose your life? Are you willing to lay down your life? Somebody said, I thought salvation was free. Absolutely free. Absolutely free. God's giving you a free opportunity to come in here and receive all that he has. But it's going to cost you your life. Does anybody want to receive Jesus here today? You want to get right with God? Maybe there's somebody here. There's, there's people here today. And it's not maybe. There are those who are here today. You've never had the Spirit of the Lord come upon you and change you in another person. You're the same person that you've always been. 
You never have an experience where the, you received a new heart and a new spirit and the power of the Holy Ghost came to live and dwell on the inside of you and be your motivator and be your inspire, inspiration, lead you and guide you and strengthen you. Today, God wants to change that. You can have that change right now at this moment. Maybe you're watching on the web right now or you're watching this YouTube. Wherever you're at, if you get serious with God, you know, everybody wants to just say, oh, I don't want to go to hell. Well, it's more than not wanting to go to hell. It's you don't want to live in sin anymore. You want to be liberated from sin. You want to be liberated from all these influences of, of, of the powers of darkness. Anybody's going to say, I don't want to go to hell. That's smart. Anybody's going to say, I don't want to be sick and diseased. But the Lord Jesus came to save us from our sins. This is for the people who don't want to live their own life anymore, who don't want to live in, in the same thing that men have been living in for 6,000 years. If that's you, you can call upon the name of the Lord Jesus right now, and everything will change. He'll respond to a sincere and true cry to Him, and He'll change your heart. Is there anyone? Is there anyone? Anyone, you can just come right now. Jesus is calling you. You need to step out of your chair. You need to step out of your comfort zone. And you need to come up here. And you need to bow yourself. And then when you come up here, you're signing up. You're saying, Pastor, you can hold me accountable. You can call me up and say, why is it that I'm not keeping my, why is it that I'm not keeping my promises with God? You can remind me. That's good because the Lord Jesus doesn't run out of mercy. God doesn't run out of mercy. There's not a single soul that he doesn't love. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son to deliver us from the world. To deliver us from sin. Jesus said, if, you'll, if you simply obey me, he said, then my father will love you. At that moment, my father will love you relationally. And we'll come make our abode with you. I'm just going to give a few more minutes. I want you to know, you, somebody said, well, I'm not, ready to, I'm not ready to surrender my life to the Lord. Look, all you're doing when you say that is you're solidifying your allegiance with the powers of darkness. You're solidifying your allegiance with hell. Your contract with death being, being that much more ratified. Will you be lulled to sleep in this time of deception we be lulled to sleep in this realm of self-justification or will you surrender all for him all to him I also want everybody that's going to be baptized today I want you to go ahead and come up those that are being baptized today I want you to come up because I just want to minister a little bit to you because, we're, you know, we're talking about buried with him by baptism and his death. I mean, when, when you go to the water to be baptized, dear people, I'm going to just help you understand something. You are witnessing before God and angels. You're entering into a covenant. You know, when men entered into a covenant in the Old Testament in, the, in those days, if they broke the covenant, they would, they, were say, they would say, if I break this covenant, let all that I have be dispossessed and seized and taken away from me. Because they put their whole life into the covenant. Jesus put his whole life into this covenant. You and I are putting or bowing to put our whole life into this covenant. To say that we're buried with him by baptism and his death. We don't live for ourselves anymore. What about me it isn't even in the equation. It isn't even in the speech anymore. Somebody said, well, I can't do what God's called me to do because my husband or my wife. The Lord says you need to hate your husband. You hate your wife then. They always pulling me back and holding me back. What the Lord said in, in com the comparison of the love that you have for me, the love you have for them should be as hatred. In other words, there's no way that you should let your husband or your wife hinder you from moving forward in God. Because all you did was sell your soul for your husband or your wife. I hope you enjoy hell together. The fact of it is, it's so dark and the torment so great, you won't even know that each other's there. 
Talk about the pain. People can't even believe in the humanistic age right now. They don't even believe that a God of love has created a, a hell, an eternal torture chamber. He has. It's because you don't understand the God of love that I'm talking about. You don't understand the way he hates sin and iniquity. You don't understand the way he hates rebellion. Adam wasn't cast out of, his, out of the presence of the Lord for committing adultery. Adam wasn't cast out of the presence of the Lord for committing some act, terrible act of, of, of iniquity. He was cast out of, the Lord, out of the presence of the Lord for a simple act of disobedience. People want to make their sin okay. And other people's sin's bad. It's time you get right with God. It's time you sell out. As they used to say, lock, stock, and barrel. Listen, your husband's not going to stand with you on that day. The Lord doesn't care anything about you saying, well, I was going to serve you, but my husband. God does not expect you to submit or follow a husband who's not walking with God. He does not expect you to submit to someone who's not submitted to Christ. Don't take it out of context. You can't stand there on that day and say, well, I would have served you but my wife. Every time I started to step out, my wife. Because the Lord's just going to, he's not going to, it's not an excuse. He said, I already told you. Unless you love me more than these, you're not worthy of me. I've already told you that. Today, I want you to get it right. You're selling out to God. I want, I mean, somebody, you know, you, you might cause you to have butterflies in your stomach. Because it's so radical. You're selling out to God. You're selling out to God. You're going to have a witness that you're buried with Him by baptism into His death. And your life is not your own anymore. It's for Him. And you come under His authority. His authority. The authority of His church. Of His pastors and of His ministers. Hallelujah. Today. Today. I feel the power of God touching people that are standing up here right now. I know the Lord's moving on many of your hearts. I know people, God's moving on people's hearts that are watching us on the web and on YouTube. It's so, it's so easy to serve them. It's so easy to serve them. The way the transgressors are. But my, when you finally step over that threshold to no longer hold on to your life. And I know it's a scary thing. I know it's a scary thing to step over that threshold to now live in total abandonment. Not to be in control anymore. Everybody wants to be in control. I know it's a scary thing to step over that threshold. And you, now you no longer live. You're for his service. If he tells you to go give your life on a cross, you're willing to do it. If he tells you to go here, to go there, to do this, to do that. If he tells you to trust him. If he tells you, if he's, whatever. With whatever. You're with total abandonment. Lord, it's all about you. I serve in you. I did, you, could have, you could have said this morning. You could have come in here this morning. You could have said this to me. What does God, the Holy Ghost, have to say to me today? And then I would have delivered you the word that I just preached. It was directly to you. What a gift. What a gift. What a privilege that the Father would come and talk to us. Try to help us and convince us of the error of our ways. For the purpose that we can get right. What a privilege. What an honor. What a blessing. What a good God. What a merciful and gracious God. That he would plead with us. Literally said that his spirit wrestled with men. One day it came to the statement, My spirit should not always strive with the man or wrestle with the man, but, but because he is but flesh, the number of his days should be 120 years. It comes to this point, the Lord in his judgment said, If they don't get it in 70 years, they won't get it in 930. He said, if they won't listen to you, neither will they listen to someone that they knew were to come back from the dead. They won't hear my word. Neither will they listen. 
because they've hardened their hearts. Hey, look. The things that Jesus did that caused his disciples to believe only hardened the hearts of the Pharisees and the religious. It just made them that much more a child of the devil. Made them that much more religious. It didn't break them. It didn't break them. They weren't broken. There are people here today, right now, that have been in the church for many years and you've never really been broken and wept over the loss because you've never had that encounter with God. And you can't make that up for yourself. But when you have an encounter with God, He will give you the same affection, the same feeling. There's so much in God that people have not been willing to experience because they justify themselves in a state of religion. And, and in that state of religion, they do not even give account to all that God declares in His Word is available for them. They act like it don't even exist or worse yet that they have it. I mean, the Pharisees standing there arguing with Jesus. He's trying to convince them, and they're saying, they're saying, no, we know God better than you. We have, you know, we have a better, John chapter 8, we have a better relationship basically than you do. We're not born of fornication. We have Abraham as a God. <laughs> We're the children of Abraham. Father wants to break us. He wants to fill us. He wants to overwhelm us. He wants to captivate us. He wants to take us from glory to glory. He wants everything that you've ever read about that was in anybody else's life that was a re revivalist, that was a person who went about doing his work. He wants that to be a reality in your life. And you can't create it in your imaginations. It's an encounter with God. I'm pleading with you. I'm pleading with you. I'm ple Somebody says, what about the time? What about it? It is time to repent. It's time to redeem the times for the day is evil. What about the time? People are so selfish, so full of themselves, so full of their own schedules, their own intents, their own purpose. They don't discern what God's doing. It's not within the framework of their own interest. I'm telling you right now, I will have a revival. I will have a great move of God while I'm alive. I will not let up. I will not stop. I'm going to stand here in this city and in this building and in this church and faithfully proclaim the words of the Lord until Father sends me somewhere else. I'm not going to let up. I'm going to be relentless. If you set me down in Japan, I'm going to be relentless. You set me down in Asia, I'm going to be relentless. You set me down in New York, I'm going to be relentless. I'm going to be relentless with you. God's calling you. He's calling you. God's calling you. God is calling you. He's calling you. There's people in here with a great call of God upon your life. You never stepped into it. You've never stepped into it. And the only reason it's not anyone else's fault, it's your fault. It's yours. You are unwilling with total abandonment to lay yourself out upon the floor in the presence of the Lord. You say, no matter what the cost, no matter what the price, I'm not living for me anymore. Your soul, your soul, going once. Your soul, going twice. Your soul, going three. Sold to you or to Jesus. Should I do it one more time? Your soul, going once on the auction block of life. Your soul, on the auction block of eternity and time. Your soul, going once. Your soul going twice. Your soul going three times. Sold. Sold to you or to Jesus Christ. You guys just press on in up here. Just press on on up here. Just press on in up here. Those of you that are coming, I just want you to press on in. Those that are coming, I just want you to press on in up here. No half measures. 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 
I want you to get so sold out to God that it does not matter where you're at. doesn't matter what altar call time it is. You're so sold out to God. You're the one that's giving it, the altar call. You're so sold out to God that everything that the Bible des describes and declares about the life of those who know Him is a reality in you. Today I want you to count the cost. Everyone that's standing up here, I see it, I feel it, I understand it. By the Spirit of the Lord, you're counting the cost. I, I see it, I feel it. You're gonna, we're getting ready to go baptize people and there's going to be a testimony. As we baptize people, there's going to be a testimony. That they are buried with Christ. That their life no longer exists. That they're buried with Him. And they raised up to life to live only for Him. You go sell your house. You go sell your land. You go sell your interest in this world. So that you can purchase yourself an inheritance in heaven. <laughs> Those things that are holding on to you and holding you back. And keep tripping you up. And keep telling you, no, you can't go all the way. No, you, you can't re totally respond to God. No, you ought to hold on. No! You're going to be able to rise up against them and shut those things down. And they won't be able to influence you in the future. But from this day forward, you give yourself to the purposes of the kingdom of God. To cry out night and day. To understand, this is why men should always pray and not to faint. So that Christ Jesus might find faith when he returns. God has a bigger plan for your life than the one you're living. The one you've been living will only bring you to misery, gray hairs, old age, discontentment, dissatisfaction. But the one that God has for you, you'll live in glory all the days of your life. You'll go from faith to faith, from strength to strength. You'll go from the fight at one fight of faith to the next one. This life that God has for you, you'll live big for Him. The very glory of heaven be seen through your life. And after this life, you'll inherit eternal life. You'll receive a crown which fades not away. Ha! <laughs> a crown! It fades not away. Father, we thank you right now that your grace has called us to a place of surrender to you. No longer to hang on to our own life or value our own life. Now, Lord, we ask you for that Holy Ghost encounter that makes the difference. Father, we ask you, oh God, for your manifest presence that call in your grace and in your mercy. Oh, Lord, an encounter with you that causes us to realize all that you've purposed to do with our life so that we can go and sell all that we have. So that we can purpose from this day forward to follow you for the life that you have for us is far better than the life we designed for ourselves. Yeah. Say, Jesus. Jesus. I call upon you. I call upon you. Come, rescue me. Come rescue me. Come deliver me. Come, deliver me. Come save me. Come me. From every influence of this world. From every, From every voice of Satan. Save me, Lord Jesus. Save me, Lord Jesus. From every power of sin and death. Sin and death. I, give I give myself over to you. To live in your kingdom. To live as your subject. To make you my king. My sovereign. My, sovereign. my savior. My master, my, master. My, Lord. my Lord, to live only for you, to, only for you. to, do, only to do only your bidding. Let your life be revealed through me. Through me. Holy, Spirit Holy Spirit, be revealed through me. Let me feel your heart. Let me feel your, me feel your passions. Feel your I give my will over to you, Lord. I will, I will only your will. Take my will, Take my will and, make and make it your own. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Lord, Jesus, Lord Jesus, I'm buried with you. I'm buried with you. 
by baptism into your death. Right now I'm crucified with you. My life is over. I no longer want to live for myself. I thank you, Lord, that I'm raised up together with you. Just like you rose from the dead. By the same miracle of faith. I no longer live. It's you that lives. I resign myself to do your will, Lord. To be taught your ways. Holy Spirit, fill me. Strengthen me. Lord Jesus, baptize me. Baptize me. In your Holy Ghost. And fire. Thank you, mighty God. Thank you, Lord Jesus.